We, we actually, sir, forgive me. We have a beautiful picture of you here somewhere, sir. I apologize, sir. I'm, I'm old school, sir. You're here somewhere, sir. Wait for it, sir. These are, oh, by, by the way, this was what we were playing, all, all of your missile defense activities. There he is, sir. Forgive me. Um, I'll keep his introduction very, very short. Uh, when I wrote his introduction, I wanted to have fun with this one. Um, so I only put two things in there. Uh, number one, uh, his mission is hit a bullet with a bullet, right? Uh, and number two, um, on a good day, occasionally I've heard him say, stellar team, noble mission. Please welcome Admiral Hill. All right. Uh, th thank you, Jim. Uh, great, great to be here. Yes, sir. Um, and even in this uh, crazy environment, uh, being able to reach out and uh, talk to uh, such a large group of folks is a real honor for me. Uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, see if I can handle the clicker here. Uh, Jim knows I'm a uh, control uh, freak, so I'm just going to do it myself here. Slides with video. Here we go. Uh, so uh, great, great to be here today. I, I know that it's the uh, FY22 Defense Programs Conference, um, and, uh, but I'll stay in the channel given the fact that the, uh, the budget has not been released yet. I'd like to just start off uh, with a quick uh, discussion on the leadership focus. Uh, it's, it's real important uh, to make sure that you're aligned, particularly when you're a defense uh, agency. So, you know, three little uh, short statements here that uh, really reflect uh, and will kind of set the table for the discussion I'm going to have with you. And I'll start with the, the SECDEF. When he says he wants to ensure we have the tools, the technology, weapons, and training, that is exactly what we do at the Missile Defense Agency for our set of missions. Uh, and when I go to uh, Chairman uh, Milley at the Joint Staff, uh, a country that masters all those technologies. So when you speak of or think of artificial intelligence, hypersonic we weapons, directed energy, again, right in the wheelhouse of what we're doing for missile defense now and in the future. And then uh, Admiral Richard, uh, the uh, head of uh, U.S. Uh, Strategic Command, he talks a lot about uh, robust, credible, layered missile defense system uh, that's paired with our conventional nuclear force capabilities, deter strategic attacks, deny benefits and impose costs. And so I'm going to talk to you about that from a missile defense perspective here over the next uh, few charts. All right, I always like to start to, with a threat. The threat is what drives what we do at the Missile Defense Agency. And this was sourced out of the Missile Defense uh, Review, so it's unclassified, but uh, I want to kind of help break down a few things for you. When you think of range, range is a key threat uh, attribute. So we tend to speak in our little inside voice about the short range, medium range, intermediate range. I kind of want you to see what the threat is advancing to. So when we talk about intercontinental ballistic missiles over 5,500 kilometers, that is range, that is reach. And our adversaries are definitely deploying that sort of capability today. And for those of you that like to convert to mileage, we have it there. What is the big challenge for the future? Uh, lower left of the chart talks about those speeds. We, we talk about hypersonic a lot. Uh, some of you may not know that ballistic missiles, when they come into the atmosphere and going towards their target, they are at hypersonic speeds. Cruise missiles are at hypersonic speeds. Hypersonic glide vehicles are at hypersonic speeds. So if you're the sailor on the deck of a ship, it all looks the same to you. It's maneuvering and it's going very fast. So what else has the threat been working on? If you look up in the upper right, it's no longer about just dumb ballistic missiles that are coming in. They're about precision strike. They have penetration aids. Think of those as countermeasures, decoys, jamming devices, those sorts of things. The real issue for us in the future is how some of our rogue nations are moving towards maneuvering reentry re vehicles and the multiple independent reentry vehicle. These are huge challenges. And when you get back down to the hypersonics and the long range cruise missile threat, it is speed, it is accuracy, and it is maneuver. And that's really what we're fighting against as we peer into the future. And I won't speak much about uh, military parades in the various countries, but they like to show off what they've got. We'll let the intelligence community figure that one out. So this is our, our, our placemat. And uh, this chart is always useful for me. In fact, when I came in as director about two years ago, I added in the hypersonic representative threat, the, the gold one coming across the middle. But, so let me walk you from bottom to top. Right? Any ballistic missile fight will start with the leveraging of space sensors because that's how we see the launch. It's going to be a big flash. There's no way around that. You come through the boost phase and then you track through uh, one of our radars, go through the field of view. Now we've got tracking information uh, on the target and we develop a fire control solution. And then when you get to the end of that track, you have to do something that we call discrimination. There's a lot of mess up there when you look at an ICBM uh, flying in, in that complex as we call it. There are spent boosters that made the news uh, this last week. There are attitude control modules. There's a solid fuel chuff. Uh, and all of that is very attractive to a radar. 
So what we have to do is develop pristine algorithms that go through and say, where is the lethal object? What is the RV? That's what I want to shoot at. So when we're managing our assets, we want to shoot the lethal vehicle. We don't care about the balloon. We don't care about the spent tank and those sorts of things. So that is how we uh, go from uh, initial indications of warning through the tracking and the fire control solution down to discrimination before we get to the kill. Uh, if you think about where the warfighter interfaces with the system, that's through command control and battle management at the top of the chart. Uh, so you see our combatant commands listed across the top. Uh, they have operational centers where they are monitoring the battle. If you think of NORTHCOM for a homeland defense uh, mission, uh, the C2BMC capability is incredibly important to put the tracks on the glass so that that fight can be managed. Uh, so then there's your ballistic track, nice predictable ballistic track, just like a football, throw the football, it's going to go up and it's going to come down. You can kind of predict that. But the reason we added that hypersonic uh, representative uh, threat across the center is to show you that life's not so easy as we peer into the future. Initially ballistic. So that sort of sets the bit on your sensor architecture. Now you think that you might have a ballistic track until it comes back down and goes into that glide just below the atmosphere in the thin air. And that is where maneuver starts, maneuvering across the globe. So the hypersonic threat is a global maneuver issue. Uh, that's the problem. And then when it comes back into uh, the atmosphere, its maneuver and its speed going towards its intended target. Very tough set of threats that we're dealing with in the future. So how do we deal with it today? Uh, so if you look in the center there, there's that large uh, ground-based uh, interceptor, right? 50-inch round. Uh, it's got one of the hardest set of requirements on it uh, from any weapon system I've ever worked on. When you have to defend all 50 states, all 50 states, that's a tough requirement to put on a missile. And so we've got those, and we're defending the country today uh, with the GBI. If you go to C, the SM-3 Block 2A uh, has the uh, intermediate range uh, capability to it and more robustness. And I'm going to talk more about the SM-3 Block 2A, which is a cooperative development with Japan when we come back later. And, and I'll show you a, a video of our latest uh, test that we executed back in November. The workhorse of the fleet, the SM-3 uh, Block 1As and 1Bs, uh, this is what the fleet's loaded out with, and those go after a range of threats to protect the sea base. And then you get down into the atmosphere right on the edge with terminal high altitude air defense with the Army. A deployable system, we've done a lot of dynamic force employments uh, you know, supporting the Army. Uh, you can drop that in a lot of different places and it adds uh, another layer of defense against uh, high end uh, ballistic missiles. When you're down at the sea base, you need something that can handle that maneuvering threat. And uh, that is our SM-6 uh, standard missile produced by the Navy. Uh, MDA works closely with the Navy to incorporate uh, some specialized algorithms that allow us to uh, leverage that uh, really great airframe so that we're maneuvering and we're taking out uh, something called sea-based terminal uh, in the terminal phase, taking out the advanced maneuvering threat. When you think about the hypersonic world and hypersonic defense, this is really our initial layer at terminal, right? But most folks, ask any warfighter, I mentioned the, uh, the sailor on the deck of a ship, when you're in terminal phase taking something out, and I spent a lot of time on flight ranges, when you have a, a nice explosion very close in to what you're trying to protect, uh, debris is going to come in. So you want to have a layered approach, and I'll talk more about how we crawl back into that glide phase in the center of the chart uh, with something called the glide phase interceptor uh, later in the discussion. And then you get down to the Patriot capability, incredible. Uh, another movable, deployable system, it's got its own radar, it's got its own fire control, uh, Army's tying the ACS program, uh, incredible capability. These are the layers when we talk about layered defense uh, from a missile defense perspective. All right, let's go to the next chart. That would be me, and I'm clicking the button. There we go. So I'm going to talk to you now about FTM-44. Uh, FTM-44 is not just the story of a Aegis ship operating in a defensive Hawaiian mode against an ICBM. It is a COVID-19 story. And why do I say that? We were directed by Congress to execute this test before the end of 2020. We were set to go in the timeline of May of last year. We had the target on station in Kwajalein. By the way, Kwajalein is part of the Reagan Test Center, also part of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, a sovereign nation. So they had COVID-19 rules there that we had to follow. We honored all of that. But in the end, we still had to shut the exercise down while we're trying to keep the crew safe on the ship and all of our folks that are running uh, uh, range operations. We had to make sure everybody was safe. So we ended up delaying that test to November. A lot of Herculean efforts to include the United States Army on Kwajalein, helping us maintain the target in, in a ready state so that we could execute this test when we were ready. 
When we finally did execute, um, I talk about an all-hands event, right? U.S. Coast Guard out there clearing the range to make sure that we had uh, full range safety. United States Navy on the, on the mighty uh, USS John Finn, new construction ballistic missile defense ship, uh, an ICBM target to launching out. Uh, pretty incredible across multiple ranges. I mentioned Reagan test site, PMRF was activated. We had Aegis Ashore participating in that event. We had the Navy's Spy 6 collecting data to further their development. And then what you see in the, in the gold areas are lots of other uh, range assets to collect telemetry, telemetry to collect uh, EOIR data so that we would know exactly how this exercise went. I'm going to show you the video now, but the one thing I want you to think about is sensor coverage over a large area like the Pacific in a long, long uh, flight of an ICBM. What that really means is that you don't have full sensor coverage going all the way through that flight. And we like to talk about uncertainties in the flight. I already mentioned the predictable ballistic track. Now we know that the adversaries will maneuver upon boosts, they will maneuver in space, and they'll maneuver when they come back in. Right? So there's a period of time where you don't have sensor coverage, which is why we need to go to space. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, but during that time, you're propagating a lot of uncertainty in that track. And so the trick is get the ship in the right position, launch the missile on the best fire control solution you've got, and then uplink and talk to the missile a lot, and then close the, uh, the error out or the, that uncertainty by diverting the kinetic warhead. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, roll you to the video so you can see this really outstanding exercise. Again, every service uh, across the United States was involved in this, and we had multiple test ranges over multiple time zones. Pretty incredible. We operated out of the uh, Missile Defense Interoperability and Operations Center up in Colorado Springs. We treated it like a strategic engagement. So here we go. The Missile Defense Agency and the U.S. Navy conducted Flight Test Aegis Weapons System 44. FTM 44 was a demonstration of the Aegis Weapons System using the standard Missile 3 Block 2 Alpha Interceptor to defeat a simple intercontinental ballistic missile threat. MDA personnel launched a three-stage threat representative ICBM target from the Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile Defense Test Site located on Kwajalein Atoll in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Shortly after launch, satellites detected and acquired the in-flight target and provided information to the Command and Control Battle Management and Communication System in Colorado Springs. C2BMC passed the target data to the Aegis Weapons System on an Aegis BMD ship, the USS John Finn, stationed in the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles to the east of Hawaii. Sailors on the USS John Finn used the tracking data to develop a firing solution. The ship then launched the SM-3 Block II Alpha using only the remotely provided satellite data, referred to as Engage on Remote. Once it reached the engagement zone and following its ejection from the SM-3 Block II Alpha third stage rocket motor guided section, the kill vehicle took mere moments to acquire the re-entry vehicle. As it approached the target, the kill vehicle continued to process its sensor data and refine its flight path. During these moments, the kill vehicle is also collecting and processing data to identify the target and then select the correct aim point. After using its divert thrusters to complete several maneuvers to finalize its path to target reentry vehicle, the kill vehicle intercepted and destroyed the RV over the Pacific Ocean north of Hawaii. The successful execution of FTM-44 demonstrated the additional capability inherent in the Aegis Weapons System, equipped with SM-3 Block II Alpha for more robust regional defense against evolving ballistic missile threats. Okay, uh, so Stellar Lancer was the name of the mission. Uh, Jim and I like to spend time talking about heraldry and uh, what that means, uh, but in case you're wondering what the missile's crossed with on that logo, it is a pike, and we could talk about that some other time, Jim. All right, engineering uh, from space. I kind of mentioned the importance of indications and warnings, so you can kind of see for a typical flight, whether it's ballistic, cruise, or hypersonic, uh, we're going to get indications and warning uh, coming from the overhead uh, IR. Uh, and then we're leveraging communications uh, across the way, right? C2BMC talking to the ship, talking to the command center, 
Uh, we're, we're talking from the ship up to the missiles, so there's a lot of uh, command going on. Uh, where we're going in the future is we'll be deploying the first two uh, hypersonic ballistic uh, tracking space sensors, that's HBTSS, uh, kind of about uh, three quarters of the way across the chart. Uh, that's in low Earth orbit. Why do we want to do that? Uh, I mentioned to you about the unpredictable maneuver, whether it's at boost, in the ballistic phase, and if you get a dim target in ballistic uh, because they're trying different propellants out, that's a real challenge uh, for radars. And then as you start to maneuver globally, this is where space really plays a large role. So we're working very closely with the Space Development Agency, very closely with the U.S. Space Force, and uh, we'll be deploying those uh, uh, here in the next uh, couple years. We have a prototype and demo of that uh, bird up there now. It's called STSS, and uh, that's the uh, Space Tracking and Surveillance System. We really learned a lot of that uh, with that system. Got two of them up. Uh, they do a lot of uh, data collects uh, for the Intel community. They participate in all of our flight tests. We have done launch and engage on remote operations using that, uh, that capability. So we're really excited about getting HBTSS deployed in the future. And then to the far right, the space-based uh, kill assessment, uh, that's deployed now. What that does is it's looking for that impact uh, and then we can get a hit assessment and a kill assessment uh, down to the warfighter. So again, space is an important part of the architecture. It's what we need for the future. It's what we have uh, today and we're just building upon that. All right, just a little bit on the glide phase interceptor. I mentioned to you that the SM-6 in a sea-based terminal mode protecting a high value unit, let's just say an aircraft carrier, uh, that's the first uh, engagement you see against that hypersonic maneuvering threat uh, on the left side of the chart. You can see that hypersonic uh, profile uh, coming from the right. We detect it in boost, right? And now we have to make sure that we classify correctly. We're coming across a glide phase. Where we want to go is engaging in the glide phase so that you have a layered defense. And so layered defense, glide phase first, and then uh, sea-based terminal. And you can see the connectivity between C2BMC, uh, what we're doing uh, with our space uh, assets, and how we intend to uh, protect uh, the carrier. If we do this uh, program right, and we're on the path to do that, this capability will be extensible to land-based units to protect uh, other assets ashore. And then kind of wrapping it up, uh, Jim, before we go over to the couch, uh, I'll just talk about uh, the foundations of missile defense, right? What we're doing is delivering credible warfighting capability to our combatant commands and to our services. We start off on the lower right with development technology. We're maturing technology. The, the next generation interceptor is an example of going through the technology development phase. We get to production and fielding. That includes the high-end uh, tests that we're doing, very similar to what I showed you earlier with FTM-44. Uh, and then we're going to go up and we're going to support the uh, services uh, for operations and readiness. And that's really important. If you look at our partnership upper left with a UEWR, for example, we cost share upgrades and processing and threat updates uh, with the Air Force and with the Space Force. If you look at what we do with the Navy to the right, uh, we, we uh, bring in the ballistic missile defense, integrated air missile defense uh, to the Navy ships, and they go off and they execute, and then we support where required. Uh, and then, of course, I mentioned uh, that earlier in CTBMC kind of to the right, and we just talked about space. So that wraps me up, uh, Jim, and I'm looking forward to sitting down on the couch. Yes, sir. All right. All right, let's do it. Okay. So you remember Dr. Bill of Plants? All right. Well, thank you, Admiral Hill. I want to just mention two things before we go right into the question, really quick uh, shout outs. One is I said to you in the green room, you and uh, General Pee Wee Fick have the two hardest jobs in acquisition, the head of MDA and the PEO for F-35. So thank you for your service. And the second is... And I, and I think I mentioned to you, Bill, that uh, Pee Wee and I spend a lot of time in the dark talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, sir. The, se <laughs> the second point was, which is a sh really a shout out to him and his leadership, as well as, like for example, General Raymond. I mean, imagine doing an engage on remote FTM test in the middle of COVID. Yeah. Admiral Hill leads a workforce of civilians and active duty that is diverse, eclectic, and managing to pull all of this off in the middle of COVID is remarkable. So just thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And, and, and I, I way oversimplified, you know, that story. When you think about having to have shadow teams in the event that somebody gets sick, yeah. right, uh, you know, pre-stationing folks, putting them through the quarantine timelines, same thing, you know, the United States Navy with the ship's crews being very careful about what ports they, they dropped into as they were going on, on the station, the work done by the Army on uh, Kwajalein and Mech Island. It really is stunning uh, to, to see what uh, the United States uh, Department of Defense can pull it is, off. It's remarkable. Yeah. And just thank you for you, your leadership and your team for you. what you're doing for the country. So our first question is from NOC Mission, Bart Olson. Bart? Oh, Bart. Hey, John. How you doing? It's been a long time. 
Yeah, you're looking healthy, Bart. Good to see hey, you. Um, yeah, it's nice to see that you're up to FTM 44. I, I remember uh, FTM 1. That's how far back I go. So, uh, hey, um, uh, I know you have a very challenging mission on the counter hypersonic side. And uh, one, of, one, of my, uh, one of my questions is, how are you uh, looking at uh, JADC2 as a capability that the agency can use to help support your mission going forward? Hey, thanks, Bart. Uh, great to see you. And uh, yeah, and thanks for the question. Uh, JADC2 is a critical part of our future. Uh, when I mentioned uh, command and control battle management, C2BMC, uh, early in the discussion, uh, we are within our program of record uh, integrating with JADC2. So we have a fully integrated uh, system across what we call the missile defense system. We treat it as a singular system. And so that, that integration path, as you know, is very, very hard when you're speaking in terms of multiple services, uh, homeland defense and regional capabilities, all of that tied together with C2BMC. We worked with all the services to bring in Navy ships, to bring in uh, Air Force assets, uh, to bring in Army assets. Uh, that's gone really well. So we've learned a lot and we're working, uh, we're, we're taking those lessons learned and we're learning from the JADC2 team, but we, we intend to fully integrate with JADC2 and leverage that capability because it's exactly what uh, the, the joint fight requires. Thank you, thank you, Bart. Thank you, uh, thank you, Admiral Hill. Uh, next question is from Deborah Factor from Airbus. Deborah? Good morning again, um, and Admiral Hill. So you spoke a little bit about your uh, the role that space is playing in your architecture. Could you elaborate a little bit more about your relationships with Space Development Agency and DARPA and into the Space Force on how you're collaborating on those architectures, um, how the different layers of SDA fit in with HBTSS and follow-ons, um, and how your needs are informing what they're doing and vice versa. Sure, great, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, the roles and missions of SDA and MDA are very, uh, very tightly coupled. Um, so I, I talk to Dr. Tournier on, on a regular basis um, and uh, it's a very uh, healthy linkage between the two. When you think about HPTSS when it's uh, deployed in numbers uh, with its fire control quality data requirement, and that's what's very unique to hypersonic uh, ballistic tracking sensor, uh, it's, it's that fire control quality data. We want to leverage what uh, Dr. Tournier and the SDA team is doing uh, for queuing of that system. So the wide field of view is meant really to provide the queue to the uh, fire control capability of HBTSS. So that's just one. Uh, we are actually deploying uh, some CubeSats uh, later uh, in June, uh, working with SDA to get those deployed. And the whole idea there is to kind of shake out the different linkages and uh, you know the transport layer and the communication links uh, between the satellite. So we, we are uh, tightly coupled in, in what, we're, what we're doing in the long-term view. Uh, we'll, we'll be loosely coupled uh, initially because where we wanna go in the future as we get better at space weight and power requirements on those satellites, we wanna start co-locating some of these sensors. But initially where we are at the technology, we'll, we'll mostly, we'll, we will uh, deploy HBTS uh, separately, but tied together with what uh, Derek is doing in Tron Zero and then uh, tranche one, we'll, we'll see where that goes in the future. Now, what's important about that relationship is we wanna stay aligned to the architecture within Space Force. And uh, General Raymond may have talked about it, I wasn't able to, to listen because uh, Jim was bothering me uh, in preparation for this discussion. But uh, <laughs> the, you, the tying into that architecture is, is really key. And, and so we've got a great relationship there. One of the things we're doing with the Space Force right now is leveraging every sensor that we've got, whether it's a land-based sensor or ship-based sensors to do space situational awareness. And we're doing the tasking of those sensors through command and control and battle management. So C2BMC is taking the tasking from space and rolling that uh, to our sensors so that we can look up and track and uh, contribute to the, the overall uh, picture that we're seeing up in space. So it's, it's really amazing what we're doing today. Uh, and I'm really excited about where we're going in the future because the, that threat keeps me up at night. If you ask me what keep, keeps me up at night, it is the high speed maneuver. And uh, the only way we can take it on is by uh, actually being uh, absolutely tightly coordinated across Space Force and SDA and MDA. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Admiral Hill. And, and as, as we heard from uh, Jill Raymond, we're just hearing now from Admiral Hill, and we're going to later hear uh, from the head of the Space Development Agency, there's so much synergy between each of those, those agencies, those organizations. They have different jobs related, and it's so, so good to hear them all together on one agenda. Uh, next question is going to come from uh, Sheila 
Kyogli from Jeffries. I may have pronounced oh, that Oh, Kyla. Right. Yes, sir. I know her. That, that yeah. works. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Jim. I'm surprised I got that yes, right. Yes, ma'am. Not you. Uh, good morning. Uh, and thank you, Admiral Hill. Um, maybe that slide on the missile capabilities was super helpful. How are you thinking about filling the gap uh, until next generation interceptor, you know, when you think about the potential of SM3 and that in the intermediate term? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so, and, and I think when you say the gap, uh, it's the gap of current capability that's deployed today during the timeline where we all know if you work in the weapons world, that reliability potentially falls off while you're getting ready to deploy the next uh, block upgrade, right? So I think of the next generation interceptor as that block upgrade. What I love about that program is it's competitive. We've got uh, two, as you know, uh, coming through uh, the technical uh, development phase. But what's really been great over the last couple of years is support from the department, support from Congress to do something called service life extension on the ground-based mid-course uh, defense system. It's not just about the GBIs, but it's also about the weapon system and its support. Uh, I talked a lot about sensors and uh, you know, communications across that whole spectrum. But what's great about it is we are now taking the oldest rounds, the oldest GBIs, and, and think back when those were deployed, right? 2004, right? And they've never been de-emplaced. We're taking mm -hmm. them out now, we're assessing the, the state of the propulsion, we're changing out one-shot devices, we're updating processors, we're updating the threat library. So what that allows those older missiles to do now, and we're actually changing out the boosters, is to now perform at the level of the newest ones. And so it's, to, to me, that's pretty exciting. The other thing that it does, it harvests data that has been in hardware, actually in the silos for as long as back in 2004, and now we have a hardware-based assessment for the stockpile reliability program. And those in the weapons world know how important it is to have real data as opposed to analysis. And so I think what that's gonna do, one, it's gonna raise the reliability of the overall fleet to kind of bridge that gap between when we'll actually deploy the first NGI, but it's also gonna give us a strong sense of confidence to, to the warfighter that what he's got today uh, can take on the threat. And we'll end up with higher reliability, we'll be able to work with the Northern Command, for example, to reduce the shot doctrine or the salvo policy, as I like to call it. Um, and uh, to me, it's, it's, that's how we're really uh, bridging that gap. I hope that answers the question, Sheila. Thank you, Admiral Hill. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, next question is from uh, John Shade at Rolls-Royce. John? Yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. Good. Good morning, sir, and thank you for the excellent presentation. Thanks, John. Um, I had a question a few years ago. The agency stated that it was moving away from directed energy. Uh, more recently, we've heard of a renewed interest, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that at all. Sure, absolutely. So uh, we, we don't have a renewed interest. We have a continued interest in the use of uh, directed energy, right? Lots of applications. And so a couple years ago, there was some panic uh, you know, across the, the world there that the MDA was moving away from uh, directed energy. Not, not at all the case. What we did is we worked with the Undersecretary for R&E to, to move the funding and the efforts that we had tied specifically directed energy and, and consolidated that effort. You know, uh, when I was back in the graduate school uh, in the mid-90s, right, uh, directed energy was going to be here in two years, going to be here in five years, right? Here I am today, and I'm waiting for directed energy to be able to be at the power levels that we need for ballistic missile defense and at the space weight and power levels to where we can get it up high uh, out of the, uh, uh, the air defense battery so we can take on, uh, you know, boost uh, uh, defense, for example. Uh, the reality is it's hard. Right, so not just the differing laser technologies, uh, but beam control, stability coming through the atmosphere or coming through space. And so a consolidated approach by the department is really what we're doing. And so as we graduate some of the technologies we've been working for into the R&E roadmap that then gets transitioned over to industry, that's gonna get us to the speed that we need, that'll get us the power levels that we need, and that'll get us to the space weight and power that we need. So it's a consolidated DOD effort, which I, I think is just a fantastic way to go. Thank you for the question, John, and thank you, Admiral Hill, for the great discussion. As somebody said once, directed energy has been the weapon of the future for 70 years. So hopefully, one of these one of these days, it'll it'll actually be real. Um, and I'm, I'm sincere in that. There are, there is a lot of good going on. I'm going to ask a, a, a question about NGI, just uh, sir. Uh, Gen uh, I was Ad wondering how long it would take yeah. to get you there, sir. So so uh, Admiral, as we know, that there's been two teams uh, awarded. Um, what what happens over the next several years? What's the act strategy as you see it? If you want to describe it to people, right? And so so what we have now is we made the awards to enter to the tech development phase. Once we come out of the risk reduction there and 
uh, have confidence in that design, then we move to full up development. And it's actually moving pretty quickly. If you look at the timeline to get to first emplacement in 28, and then set yourself, and that's by the way, the government reference schedule, right? Mm -hmm. Through competition, uh, we know that that date's gonna come to the left. Uh, and then you go back and you look at the flight test regime, right? So we, we, we want to flight test, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the NGI against the threat it's going against. Uh, so we have a targets program that's uh, moving in parallel with that. And we want to make sure we get a salvo shot off uh, before yeah. we actually move into production. So um, I think we've got everything set up with two competitive teams. Uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier yeah. in the green room, you know, it's a real challenge to have a development, two separate program offices. Firewall. Firewalled away and, and competing mm -hmm. with lots of interest for, from everybody to include the warfighter as it should be. And so we want to keep them fully informed on where we are as we track through that techn technology development phase. There's a lot of really uh, tough uh, threat uh, issues that we've yeah. got to meet and uh, we're gonna come through all of that and we've got a really strong uh, strategy that gets us to that first test that allows us to go to initial production and then on to a salvo test that allows us to continue on with production. And the, the department's gonna have options as it goes, right? When you've got two really great companies yeah. moving out, you have options. Do you wanna have a double production line? Do you wanna have a single production yeah. line? Where we do the down select will depend on the, the state of the it's development. It's so nice to see two teams. <laughs> I, I can't remember the last time we saw in a major program two teams like that. Right. Uh, next question is Richard, Richard Abbott from Defense Daily. Hi, Richard. Hello, thank you very much. How is uh, progress going on the long-range discrimination radar at uh, Pier Air Force Station, Alaska? I know there have been some delays due to COVID. So when do you uh, expect it to be fully ready? Okay, uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, I think you said it came in a little broken up. Uh, long-range discrimination radar, as Jim likes to call it, the murder. Yes, sir. <laughs> but, uh, Mackley's so, acronym, sir. Yeah. So, so construct. So think think of uh, LRDR as really two paths, right? There is the military construction, you know, that's <coughs> on the base up in Clear Alaska. Then there is the radar development and the delivery of that radar technology and equipment uh, to the site. Uh, so last year, at the start of the pandemic. We are right in the right in the middle of finishing up construction so that we can emplace the arrays. We had one up. We were waiting to fully populate. We actually had arrays shipping from the east coast of the United States inbound to Alaska when the site closed. So once the site closed, we went into what we call caretaker status, right? Which meant we weren't able to continue on construction, but we continued with the development and the production of the radar. So what's happened over the last uh, few months is we've completed both arrays. There's a west face and there's a north face uh, in, in the array. And these are large arrays, you know, on the order of 60 feet, 80 feet, that kind of thing. And so they're now fully populated. All the subarray suites are in place and we're going through what we call uh, calibration. So we've done our initial low power radiation and we're coming through calibration. We'll go to high power and then we'll take delivery of the radar to the U.S. government uh, by the end of the year. Uh, it's really in the fall time frame that we'll do that. Now, during that low power testing and going to high power testing, that's when you really know whether or not you've been able to successfully scale a radar, right? Everyone throws the word scaling around like it's easy. It's not, right? So when you're testing at a small version, say 128 or so of these subarray suites, and then you go up into the thousands, which is where we're at for LRDR, right? You're gonna learn something there, right? Scaling's not as easy as it sounds, uh, but we're, we're gonna get there and we're in really good shape. Uh, state of Alaska has been incredible. Uh, you may hear news about uh, EIS, uh, you know, special use uh, uh, airlines and things like that. We got to take care of the clear uh, air station. We got to make sure the bush pilots can still fly through. Um, we got to make sure that we're not in conflict with the UEWR that's up in clear. So it's a pretty complex uh, set of work. But to answer your question directly, we will take uh, delivery of the radar uh, around the September, October uh, timeframe. Uh, and then we'll move towards getting into what we call our operational capability baseline, which includes testing, right? So we're gonna fly uh, you know, ballistic missiles across the face of the radar and we're really gonna shake it out. Uh, it's it's uh, doing satellite tracking now just to calibrate and we've done a lot of uh, testing uh, out on the East Coast with, this, with the smaller uh, scaled down version of the array. So we're in that learning phase right now as we finish up the integration and, uh, and we'll bring it into the, to the GMD uh, Homeland Defense architecture over the next year. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Admiral Hill. Thank you for the question. Um, next is Lisa Hand from BAE. Lisa? Good morning, Lisa. Hi. Good morning, sir. Thank you for your remarks today, and thank you for being here. I'm interested in your thoughts on the planned contract structure for GMD Futures, and then for a broader missile defense system, and, and real specifically, how does that relate with any guidance from senior OSD officials about acquisition reform, modernization, and leap-ahead technologies and methods? Okay, great, great question, Lisa. 
So when, when you think of the ground-based mid-course defense system, you know, most everybody gravitates over to GBIs or, or NGIs. They want to talk about the missile. I get that. It's great, right? But we also have missile fields. We have silos. You have to be able to control and communicate, uh, initialize uh, before you launch, for example. You have what we call the ground system, right, and the overall weapon system. Then you have the integration of all of that, right? So the approach that we're taking is to compete those efforts without losing the success we've had in deploying and maintaining a system today that meets the warfighter need, right? So NGI, competitive uh, aspect moving forward, two companies moving out, at least through PDR, potentially the CDR, maybe to production, right? Uh, it, it all depends on the performance of those contractors. And then we are going to compete the overall ground system architecture uh, and, and I think that's important to do. So when you ask me about uh, OSD uh, senior leadership uh, views on the program, the view is that there's a competitive environment out there. When you do the market uh, research and you go off and you look at the capabilities of these great American companies, um, it's not just one that can do it, right? So we want to leverage the best that America has to offer. And so by competing and having the system with an integration separate contract for that, uh, we, we have great opportunities out there to just lever the, leverage the, the best and brightest and bring in the kind of technology that we need uh, for the future. And, and sir, just a stupid question. So going yeah. forward on the GMD next, right, we should call that the, the ground systems architecture will be the recompetition piece. Perfect. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, would, and would, were there two or three other pieces that I forgot? No, I, I, again, think of it as the missile, think of it as the, the ground system, and think of it as overall uh, systems integration and testing. Okay. And then the legacy GBI, right? And then, there's, a, then there's an in-service, uh, you know, support uh, piece yes, for that, which is really critical because we, we don't want to yes, lose sir. what we're doing there. And a dumb question: And does, is that competed or not? Um, well, we'll. Uh, I'd or like to TBD. talk about that acquisition strategy separately. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let me show. I'm okay. sorry, sir. I no, didn't no, mean no, to drag you into no, the shallow. Those are great questions, and I know yes, that's sir. where Lisa was going. I'm not trying to be cagey at all, but we are in the middle of having discussions with industry right now, so yes, I don't want to get ahead of that. I apologize. All sir. right, no, no problem. Thanks, Jim. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Great question. Uh, Jen Judson from uh, Defense News. Jen? Hi, yes. Hi, Admiral. Um, Hi, Jen. A, a recent GAO report um, expressed concern that the SM3 Block 2A might not be suitable um, or realistic for Homeland Missile Defense Layer. Um, and they noted cost, schedule, capability concerns, and that the ICBM test in November might have been under just two ideal conditions. Uh, what's the MDA's path going forward to assess the SM3 Block 2A for the layer, and what's your approach in the coming year to continue to assess that? Hey, thanks, Jen. Uh, great, great question. So first, we got we got to go back to first principles here. What was the Aegis Combat System designed to do, and what was the SM3 Block 2A designed to do? They were Aegis, by the way, was designed to do air defense, and we leveraged the robustness uh, in that capability to go into space tracking and eventually ballistic missile defense, and now integrated air missile defense, which the way I define that is doing ballistic missile defense operations with air defense at the same time. So there's that. Uh, the SM3 Block 2A cooperative development with Japan was designed to go against in intermediate range uh, missiles, right? So part of that test in November. Uh, and the reason why we went with a simple ICBM, which meant it wasn't full of countermeasures and other things to screw up the system, it was to prove that we have the ability to leverage the robustness in the program, right? So that was really the first test, just to see if it's feasible. And we learned a lot, right? Most folks would tell you that it was about the, the, the closing velocity coming down. What they forget, though, is that a ship will maneuver to get the highest PK possible, and that's exactly what the USS John Finn did, maneuvered, shot the missile, lots of uncertainty because of sensor or lack of sensor coverage for such a long range flight uh, where, where we were doing the, the exercise. And so what we actually saw was a really high divert. So, so kind of two walkaways from that first test, which is why I think it was really important, mm -hmm. was that it was the longest propagated error or uncertainty that we have ever seen in any test. Uh, and then we had the highest divert that meant the missile was maneuvering to actually take it out, and it still took it out, which is really great. So that, in terms of feasibility, did we accomplish the mission? Absolutely, every, t every test objective uh, achieved uh, in November. So what's next? What's next is to go against a more complex uh, intercontinental ballistic missile threat, and maybe even change the scenario. This scenario was a defensive Hawaii scenario against a rogue nation, you guess which one, out there in the Pacific. And in the future, uh, we're going to go to a more complex, and that's within the next couple of years. So we're still analyzing data from November, and then we're going to make upgrades and changes to the combat system, and we'll make changes to the missile in terms of threat set 
uh, to take on a higher end uh, uh, class threat. And so we're working that, that target now. So that's really the next event from a test perspective. But there is some development that's required because it is a different threat set in a different regime for both the ship combat system and for the missile. And so we'll, we'll come through that. Now tied to that, of course, Jen, is policy, right? And so we have to decide, do we want ships uh, you know, in that role of being off the West Coast, for example, uh, in, a, in a ship station to defend against ICBMs as a layer to the ground-based mid-course defense. That's an incredible conversation. We're having that now, um, and it's, it's hard to predict where it will go. And, and the department will decide, uh, you know, what the best approach is. So, Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And, Thank you, Jen. And, and an incredibly, please forgive me for being aggressive, but it is a policy decision, but, but who wouldn't want, you know, Credible perspective and cost separately, right? Right. If you're talking about the survival of the United States, who, who would not want those additional yeah. options? So it goes back to what Jen was saying, right? Is it credible, right? So uh, feasibility against a you know simple ICBM is one thing. Yes, sir. Going against a more complex, maybe even one that maneuvers, right? That's another thing. So yes, we're building NGI to take on the threats. Would I like another layer? Um, you know, hey, I'm, I'm the technical development guy, right? Yes, sir. Uh, the answer is, I, I think there's a way to go do that. But part of that is not just parking a ship or doing something else uh, with an SM3. You know, you've got to integrate, right, uh, the command and control pieces, right? So right now, uh, General Van Herc of North, Northcom, you know, doesn't uh, have the tracks on the glass that an Aegis ship would see, right? So there's some integration that would have to happen right. in order to enable that. Now, we've done integration with that in Patriot. And we've integrated that in Aegis. What we have not done is integrated these regional systems with the homeland system. Understood. So it's a yes, fair sir. policy discussion, but it's also a technical discussion. We need to come through that and prove to ourselves that that capability is real and credible and that the costs are within something that the American public would want to fund. Yes, sir. So Admiral, Admiral Hill, um, you, 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 uh, you are the recipient of requirements. You're the recipient often of policy, although a participant. Um, do you want to comment, or if you can, on um, Policy, uh, is there going to be an, a, a ballistic missile defense review, for example? What do, what do you see from where you sit on when yeah. the schedule and all the rest of that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the last missile defense review, not a ballistic missile, it was a missile defense missile review. Defense so it was pretty broad Department. and it was, uh, you know, kind of beyond the bounds of what MDA does, right, which is, I, I think, the right uh, approach to go. So the, the missile defense review back in 2019, you know, done, complete, uh, actions, uh, you know, on the table, that kind of thing. Um, I, there is discussion about a future missile defense review, but that's going to be paced by other things like yeah. the national defense strategy update, yes. and then we'll get to a missile defense review. I always think it's fair to, to go off and, and look at that, um, whether it's how we do things, where our requirements come from, how do we do it today. We have a unique process in MDA where STRATCOM, I mentioned Admiral Richard at the beginning, yes. provides me a missile defense integrated priorities list, and that's what I use as a primary warfighter driver when I develop a POM. There's that. It's unique and different for a good reason. Uh, and then our acquisition processes are, are different. We follow the law, we're al aligned to DOD 5000, but we're a capabilities-based organization. And uh, if, there, if there's a review on that, I think it's gonna be more uh, about integrated air and missile defense, because that, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the threat is coming at us from lots of different ways, right? And we're, we're, you know, we're, we're part of that uh, discussion, but uh, a review is likely gonna happen after the, uh, the NDS. Uh, an, uh, another question, just for you, you, in your excellent talk, you mentioned that STSS, the two satellites, and all the great right. stuff. It's 2021. I would right. never have guessed right. that STSS would be in 2021. Me either, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is that is it's uh, remarkable? Yeah. What do you want to comment yeah. on that? Yeah. yeah. So it really is. And and when you uh, think about uh, space systems, right? When you're trying to you know, incorporate as much uh, commercial leverage as you can over the next few years, and you kind of put a life of that bird, you know, as as a requirement when you go in, and, and generally for for things that are that you can put up quickly and at lower cost, you would expect them not to live very yeah. long. Uh, STSS is an example of that. It's, it's been deployed for many, many, many years. It turns out that we are gonna sunset those. Okay. So as we uh, bring uh, HBTSS up, uh, we're just about out of fuel. We've got uh, control systems that are getting a little bit aged, and so we're gonna go ahead and bring them down in the next couple years. That's, that's yes, wonderful. Sir. Don't you? Oh. I, I'm, go ahead, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm smiling, sir, is yeah. even though the red light has come on, we, we secretly built an extra uh, five minute reserve into well, your okay. time, sir. So you, There's lots it, of red lights here, Jim. Yes, I sir. Know, if it's, no idea which one you're talking about. Yes, sir. If it's okay with you, sure. could, could we run another five minutes? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Bill. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so this gets back, and maybe this is a, a bad question, but for those of us that are old like me, I remember a lot of excitement, in quote, around what was used to be called standard missile 32B. 
right. which, is going to, which is going to be a faster interceptor, which we, we stopped it, we didn't do it. Right. Is there any, um, any discussion, any analysis, any S&T on what, a, what a, a faster version of the 2A might be, or is that, is that, is that on hold? No, it's, it's still in discussion. I would say where, where that conversation is happening today is VBO, right? The velocity yeah, of burnout, really burnout important, velocity, right? right. And so when we're looking at the glide phase interceptor right now, we're trying to move as quickly as we can through a capabilities-based approach, right? So we want to leverage the propulsion stacks that we have today for a near-term capability. But if you look long-term, you know, because I talked about uh, C-based terminal, then I talked about the glide phase, right? And as you continue to move further back into a hypersonic trajectory, for yeah. example, uh, you know, VBO becomes a real big discriminator. Yes, yes it does. Um, so it's in discussion um, for the longer term, you know, next phase of the glide phase uh, interceptor. Uh, from a uh, GBI perspective, um, we, we're, we are not taking a, a hard look at that. And for the future of SM3, I think it's going to be something else. And a related question uh, Are there any things, I imagine there are, in, about your industrial base that keep you awake at night? What are you concerned about? Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about everything on, on that one, Bill, but I, I would say uh, propulsion, um, you know, if, if you look at what the adversaries are doing yeah. and, you, and you look at the two propulsion houses that we have today, right, they're, they're always a little fragile That's right. you know, as we move up, move up and down. Um, I'm concerned about the electronics industry, right, uh, that's, that's an issue for us. Yes. Uh, and when I look at the high-end materials that we need to operate in some of these regimes, you know, you're very familiar with like seeker technology yeah. when you're operating, say, up in glide phase. Yeah. Uh, or going through some really nasty man-made environments, you, you have to have um, a, an industrial base that can deliver that in numbers, right? Otherwise, uh, we're left uh, doing that on our own, and that's 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 the hard piece to deal with. Uh, in the and again, base. that gets back to the kudos of having two teams yeah. on NGI. Absolutely, that right. is so important. Yeah, it's so important. Um, Jim, do you have anything final you want to? Yes, sir. Yeah. And we're we're down to like the last. We've already overrun, yeah, but right. I apologize. I don't, want, just, the, I don't want the band no, no, to start this is, playing before I get this, this is this fine, is sir. Wonderful. Yeah. May, may, may I? Um, sure. Jen touched on something I thought was very productive. Uh, two questions. One is, is number one, more insight into uh, where you're going with uh, evolving the regional glide phase weapon system, right, to be able to get further reach so you're not having to stop it with an SM3, right, at shipboard. Uh, and then number two, is there, is there, how do you address on the NGI separate issue, sir, um, the affordability? That, that, that came out with kind of a high price tag Right. And for the American people, how, what, what's the message to really get across to them about yeah. that this is the this is the combat power that you're really buying from that system? Yeah. So, so let me. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the next generation interceptor in terms of cost. Right. There's lots of discussions going on about you know what does life cycle cost look like? What does the initial development cost look like? What you have to remember is you know first we we set down a government reference schedule right which then you do a cost assessment against. So you have that, right? And then you have an independent look at what that might be. So those assumptions could be different, right? Mm. In yes, the sir. end, you right. end up with a spread between what the original government estimate was versus, say, the CAPE analysis, right? right? Which could be different. And then you have to ask yourself, what levers can I pull to control costs? Okay. Well, it's not just putting more money in the budget, right? But there's also, when can you downselect? There are, are you meeting knowledge points? So you want to have those set into the acquisition strategy I asked earlier about there, Bill. Mm -hmm. And so we have lots of other levers to control or to modify throttle industry's uh, response uh, to the requirement set. It's not just about money, but where we are today is we took a conservative approach within the department. Let's yes, make sure we don't underfund this program, yeah. right? So there's, there's a large amount of risk that's in the budget today, assumed risk, assumes everything goes bad. And, and that's that's what's causing that uh, you know that spike uh, in the yes, cost. Sir. Okay. But if the industry performs to the knowledge points and on time, and comes down. then the numbers uh, go way down, which is what we want. And we think that we're set up to get that sort of behavior. But I do appreciate uh, the work within the department to ensure we weren't underfunding the program because that that happens on, on other projects. You've seen that before. Yes, sir. Uh, Great. The dreaded red light has returned, sir. Yes. Okay. I is there, is there any GPI any question. last closing thoughts, sir, that are important for the audience? Uh, no. You said it at the beginning, Jim, and, and I'll just repeat it. Um, you know. Stellar team, noble mission. You know, I wake up every morning. I, there's no confusion to me on what I'm going to focus on, right? When you're named the Missile Defense Agency and you've got the quality of people that we have at the Missile Defense Agency, it makes uh, life uh, easy. The threat is hard. Uh, what the whole department, what the nation is facing today, uh, it's, it's some really difficult times. And so we're, we're glad to be a part of it. And again, uh, stellar team, noble mission. Thanks for listening. Well done. Thank well you. done, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Perfectly done. All right.